bit of a surprise presentation at the very last minute, um, and it's because of the fact that I, I really believe that this is the kind of stuff that we're going to be talking about for the next couple of years, even though it's changing really quickly. I find this one of probably the most interesting subjects in security today. Um, really the identity issue, how we go about developing trust frameworks, how we make sure we keep that balance and preserve it between privacy and security. And before I start my presentation, um, I work for Verizon Business, but I work for them out of Europe. So I'm based here in Amsterdam, uh, and I work for an American company. So the majority of the opinions that I'm going to express are mine. I've got to say that for the guys at legal. Um, because if I use any bad words, or you know, which might happen, um, I just don't want to lose my job after I come back from maternity leave. So that's the next thing I want to say, because a funny thing happened to me on the way to Hack in the Box. Um, so about 12 days ago, I had a, a little baby girl. So apologies. <laughs> if this is a bit all over the place. What I do want to ask you is, I have about 25 slides. I'm just going to go through them. I'd like you to save your questions to the end, because I do want to take questions, and I do want to hear what you think about this. I'm going to try to not go uh, really down to the technical stuff, but we are going to cover some stuff just to make sure that everyone's on the same page. Yeah? Feel free to shout back. I love participation. So, um, so what's the issue? So why are we even here talking about this? The fundamental basic thing is that there's a high degree of complexity when you talk about just consumer identities, just people, just you and me, um, in terms of we just have too many passwords, there's too many sites, there's a huge digital footprint you leave behind every time you have these multiple passwords, uh, all this complexity, you, you know, store stuff on all these pages, there's cookies, it's a mess. It's a mess and it's very, very difficult to keep track of everywhere you've been and everything you've done and all the ways to control it across all of these different schemes. And for enterprises, it's equally as difficult. So just across... Yeah? Why is the complexity a bad thing? Why is your question, why is the complexity a bad thing? Um, I'm going to quote Einstein for a second. Einstein said anyone can make anything complex, but it takes someone who's intelligent to make it easy and to break it down to the smallest parts. And I genuinely believe that about identity. I don't think it should be that hard. It's ridiculously hard now. And I think that there are solutions out there that can make it easier. And I think any time you have a system that you have to build in ways to kind of break it down again, you've inherently added to the security risks. So. I believe that the complexity actually makes it less secure. I think a very straightforward, easy-to-use system is actually fundamentally more secure. So um, this is the basic challenge for enterprises and for people. And basically what we're saying is we just need a better solution. And, you know, a lot of people are saying it. So if you're really into analysts and Forrester and Gartner and all those big boys, you know, the biggest reason that it hasn't happened yet is because they've got to find a way to make real money off of it. That's the fundamental problem, right? So there's no real big incentive and driver to develop these solutions and reduce that complexity and make it easy and make it beautiful. But it could be really cool if you just had a place or a couple of places, you know, that you trusted, people you trusted in real life or brands you trusted in real life, that you would let them manage your online or government or uh, virtual identity for you. And I think that there's real benefits there too, because, you know, it's clear from things like uh, Groupon and all that kind of targeted marketing stuff that there actually is a place for targeted marketing. It's just not being done very well. So if there is a way to do it securely and get the discounts for you know, the population en masse, I'm not talking about just the guys in this room who probably will be too paranoid to use a system where you put all of your stuff in one place, but for the general population to be able to use that kind of targeted marketing capability and to get discounts and offers and, you know, get out of a plane and then already be checked into your hotel without ever having to deal with the girl at reception, there are some real benefits there. So the idea is that when you have um, 
an actual business model that pays companies back, that makes it worth their while to want to invest in identity solutions, it won't happen. Governments and enterprises are, you know, have the same issues as well. They're trying to find, okay, what's the technology that I need to adopt that's going to be future-facing? What do I need to do to actually you know, be uh, assured of a high level uh, of, of assurance when I want to issue a credential to a citizen. So um, I'm not going to talk about it at the moment, but you guys are all aware, I think, about the Dutch issues um, that we've had in terms of government identity. Yeah? Is there anyone that's not aware of the Dutch issues around government identity? Really? Okay. So. Um, yeah, you can read about it. It's this um, uh, scheme called uh, DIGID, D-I-G-I-D. And, and there's actually a flyer walking around. I wanted to use it as a prop, but I don't think I've got it here. Anyway, the, the point is, and it's called Dog ID. But the, so it's, if you go outside, you'll see stuff on it as well. Just Google DIGID. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff. I'm not going to slam them during my talk now because I've spoken to them before. So, um, but the point is, it's really interesting exactly what happened. And fundamentally, what it is is they had a security breach, and they weren't um, uh, conducting themselves in the most responsible way in order to uh, close it quickly enough. So, fundamentally, we need a better solution for identity. And if you look across cloud identity providers, there's a lot of issues, and the fundamental issue there is around interoperability. So let's just take John Doe, right? He just needs a really simple way that's easy, cool, and cheap, and safe to use. And he wants to be able to use it with all different kinds of schemes, so username and password, but also uh, things that require you to use some form of strong authentication. So if you have to get an SMS one-time password, or if you need to get a token or another credential, or if you need to use some sort of geolocation service, for all of those different things, we call them form factors for identity authentication. Um, and regardless of which form factor needs to be used, you want to be able to have that basic support set up in any system. You also want it to be able to have interoperability in terms of standards. So regardless of whether it's an X509 certificate or using RADIUS or uh, open authentication, it should all be supported. And then fundamentally, as a user, what you want to have is those same three things that everybody else wants to have, regardless of whether they're enterprise or government or private citizen. They want identity issuance, so give me a credential. They want to be federated. You got to be able to let me use it in more than one place, right? And then finally, I want to be able to know something about risk. And it's not just for governments and enterprises, but it's also for people. And the reason it's for people is you want to have some faith in the services that you're using. So you want to be able to know what kind of risks you're taking, and you want to be able to know that the back-end systems are able to support that with the brands you trust. So if you are you know, doing some sort of online banking with uh, an online identity service, then you want to know that that banking back-end system is able to have different risk scores and protect you from someone who's trying to steal your identity or misuse it, et cetera. Um, and finally, there's a lot of development right now in terms of standards. So there's Kantara Initiative, there's OpenID, there's still uh, older uh, things that are running around still in small forms like Higgins and Liberty. So all of those different standards are still competing. Fundamentally, I think that the competition is, is a moot point. It shouldn't be about competition. It should be about, you know, support it. Just support it. Make sure that you have the interoperability in place initially so that you can increase um, the uptake of the actual service. And then you have... Um, what makes the complexity even greater, you have all these different relying parties. And relying parties are the guys that want to take your identity and do something with it. So um, I'm going to pick on someone. The guy in the cool Puma shirt. Hi, sorry, I'm just picking on you because you're in the front. Um, what's your favorite brand other than Puma? Apple, okay. So let's say you wanted to log on with your, um, I'm going to say your iTunes ID, but, um, but let's say you wanted to log on to Apple. Apple would be the relying party, but you could log on to Apple at the moment using your Apple ID, but let's say you could also use your Facebook ID or your Google ID or your Open ID. 
Th that's the kind of services that you want to make use of, but the guy that you're, who's relying on that credential from you is Apple. So I just wanted to make it clear, because I'm using terms that you may not have heard before, so that's what a relying party is. It's parties like Apple. It's part the party that you want to do business with to get stuff from iTunes or uh, go to the Apple store and you know buy a new iPad, whatever. Those are relying parties. Yeah? Are those ideas clear, what I just talked about now in terms of the issues around interoperability and standards? OK. I'm always going to have to walk back to my laptop. That's not very well done. Um, OK. So in terms of the MoClo, so <laughs> at Verizon, we love making terms. So the MoClo is the mobile cloud era. And what it's about, it's a shift in paradigm. So um, we really like security at Verizon. It's our sweet spot. And when we look at security, we tend to look at it uh, historically by looking at things like, you know, in towers, platform services, software services. We have a secure gateway that protects, protects the perimeter. So, you know, firewall, antivirus, IDS, spam, content, blah. And we do have this holistic um, way to look at the whole thing. You know, everyone says it's holistic and it's, I, it's a neologism that's fine. Um, but when you really want to look at what you're doing for identity, it's not something that's behind the firewall that you're trying to protect, it's something that's beyond the firewall. So you're looking at authentication, you're looking at authorization, you're looking at actually controlling the uh, flows that would be used by any user that would try to um, do something potentially dangerous to that service. So for all of these things, the way that you need to look at identity is fundamentally different than w how we traditionally addressed identity. So if we l summarize this challenge, you've got a person, they've got some sort of credential or identifier, and then what they're trying to do is they want to have this balance between privacy and identity assurance. So I want to know that when I'm using that credential, it's secure, but I also want to know that it's private, so that the stuff that I'm doing is not going to be held any longer than it needs to be, that the actual anonymity of the transaction is kept, and the only thing that needs to be sent across the wire is the claim or request that I'm actually putting out. So, for example, if I want to access a Heineken website or a porn website or something else, there's very often some form of age verification technology. And if it's not just a yes, I'm over 18 click button, and it's actually something that's a bit more profound and requires you to be registered with an identity verification or an age verification service, then this would be something that you would look at um, uh, doing with someone you actually trust that means that, okay, well, I know that when I'm using this service that they're uh, using my data responsibly and they're not doing anything weird. These are all good things, right? And when we w talk about what we just mentioned to uh, the guy in the Puma shirt, we talked about being able to use uh, a login um, that's, that we like to call a NASCAR login. How many people know NASCAR? Okay, there's one guy in the room that knows NASCAR. NASCAR is the American equivalent of the Formula One races. And the idea is that the cars are like covered from fender to fender with stickers of all the logos that sponsor them. So you have every single company, you know, Coca-Cola to whatever, all over the car with their stickers, and uh, that's the NASCAR concept. So it's the same thing as this. So when you want to sign in, you can um, sign in with all of these different logos. So Facebook, Twitter, Google, Yahoo, etc. You guys are all familiar with this, I'm assuming. Yeah. Okay. So if we look at uh, claims-based authentication, so if we take the NASCAR example, this implies some form of federation between all of these different parties. But to what extent the data is actually being used? Is it just the, the actual login, or is it just, yes, this person has a valid login? Those kinds of things are what need to be underpinned by systems that are non-technical, so like legal agreements or whatever kind of contract. And what you want is some sort of standardization across this. So I have an example for you of a claims-based authentication where it's to block or unblock uh, 18 and over content on mobile. So this is from O2. And what you need to do is O2 relies on a credit card company to verify that you're over 18. So you have to use your credit card. They verify that you have this credit card and you're over 18 in order to use it. They then issue an um, uh, SMS one-time password, which you can then enter, uh, when you get your ver which is your verification code, and then you can continue using those services. 
And that's a claims-based representation where the credit com company doesn't need to supply any information. So they don't need to actually say, he's 32, he's not, he's over 18. They just, the question is, are you over 18? And the answer is just yes or no. And that's an example of a claims-based authentication example that actually protects your privacy. Because do you want people to know how old you are necessarily? Okay, so. Um, and if you take a look at how it actually works in the back end, here's a sample architecture. So if you look in terms of a trust framework provider, what you've got is you've got this happy looking guy. Oh, where's my mouse? You've got this happy looking guy in the center who's the user. And then uh, what he's doing is he'll go to a, an IDP or he gets somewhere a credential. So he, he has been validated that he is who he says he is with a passport or with a driver's license, whatever. So they actually know you are who you say you are. So the guy in the Puma shirt is actually, I'm sorry, you, you were just in the front, you got picked on. And that's, do, you, do you have a name that I can use? Jason, a last name too? Okay, give me another one. Uh, All right, Jason Doe. So Jason Doe is, um, has been validated to be Jason Doe, and so we validated based on some like physical world, tangible form of identification. Once we've done that identity proofing, and it depends on what the transaction is, that requires that level of assurance. So we can determine just how strong that is. So do I actually need to go to his house? Do I need to check his insurance records? Do I need to see his driver's license? Do I need to see two forms of ID and an electricity bill or, you know, very little and just something with a name and a picture? Um, so depending on all of that, we've done the identity proofing. What we then would do is go to an IDP. These could be the same company, by the way. So in the drawing, they're looking like they're separate but it could be one person, just like I showed you in the previous example, that's doing all of those services. It's just a service that you need, and it's a potential architecture that could be heterogeneous, but it could also be homogeneous. So you could have commercial identity providers, but you could also have them from the government. And the Dihi Day example is a good example of a, of, a, of a mix, actually, between a commercial and a government entity. So the government outsourced it to a commercial provider, Dihi Notar and Dihi Day, and they jointly formed this uh, service around uh, providing certificates and providing the uh, government um, authentication mechanism. So here in this diagram, you've also separated attribute providers. And we're going to talk in the next slide about what an attribute is. And the idea is you have commercial attribute providers and government attribute providers. And fundamentally, what it means is that um, people will know stuff about you. We'll talk about what attributes are in a minute, but w they will know stuff more about you. Like, he loves Puma, his favorite color is red, um, you know, the preferences that you like, uh, your behavior, your online shopping uh, behavior. And when they have all of this information that they've collected, they can see how they share it with the IDP when you're trying to do a transaction with a relying party. Yeah? So now I'm, I'm, I'm cool with using these terms. You guys know what I'm talking about when I say relying party, attribute, provider, and IDP, right? Any questions about that? Okay. All right. So if we take a look at the actual session, um, you've got two fundamental protocols that are like winning the battle, and it's SAML and ADFS. And ADFS is just the Active Directory Federation Services. So if you take a look at how that works, let's say initially you would request a target resource. So you go onto your website, you want to do something with uh, Apple. Um, and then your IDP, whoever that be, that could be Verizon, or it could be someone else, or it could be Google, but you go to the website that you want to do something with. They figure out who your IDP is based on your selection. Then they respond with a form. You request the sign-in services. You identify who you are and what the user is doing. You can respond. And then the service provider will again or rather, you send the assertion to the customer, uh, consumer service, and then you get redirected to the resource you want, so your uh, iTunes page or your Apple Store uh, uh, resource. Um, and then you can actually request it and get the target resource. But it's just an interaction between those three parties. It's really simple. 
Any question? It's really, really simple. And the thing is, depending on the type of transaction, you can make it as complex or as easy as you want. So the amount of detail that's supplied is totally dependent on what you're trying to do. Are you trying to buy something? Are you just trying to look at a page? Are you trying to change your billing details? So depending on the severity of the actual transaction that you're trying to accomplish, it'll ask you for more or less detail. And, you know, when you look, what you really need is this strong authentication. So what the ID broker will do, the party that's sitting in between, and they get the cha-ching every time you go to a relying party. So the idea is they don't have to charge you every time you go to your iTunes store and you want to use your identity for that purpose. So depending on what your ID broker can provide. They can do the whole risk-based authentication, uh, an analytics engine, take in all of those different form factors that you see, both tangible and intangible form factors. So we talked about things like, you know, your RSA key or your phone or your thumbprint or your PIN and username or biometrics, uh, voice recognition, all of that stuff is valid. So depending on all, aggregating all of that, they can issue some sort of risk-based score and then allow you to access a resource or not. So if you look for attributes, now we're going to talk about attributes for a moment. So every digital subject has a bunch of attributes, and this is like the standard definition. So you've got attributes that are things like um, uh, your age, uh, your medical history, you, the fact that you uh, are in a particular income bracket. All of those things are things that define who you are and that can be uh, sent about you to a relying party. In terms of preferences, they're really things that you like. So we talked about that he likes the color red, or he really likes Puma shoes, uh, and he really prefers to pay in um, uh, guilders. So, and, and traits are things that you can't change. They're really things that are inherent about you. So on your passport, or I'm not even sure if it's on the Dutch passports at the, any, anymore, but it was definitely on um, so previous European passports. It used to have hair color and eye color in addition to having your photo there. It has that information contained actually on your passport. So it would have your hair color and eye color. So th those traits are just harder to change. And, that's really the clue about traits. There's something that stick with you, whereas behavior can change, preferences can change, and really the attributes can also change. So if you take all of that, how would you actually go about you know, combining those things, those attributes, those traits, those behavior, those form factors, into actually creating something that you can say meaningfully about risk? So if you take a look, the way that we do that is you can establish a risk score. So you take components of that, and you can say, I'm going to look at assurance levels. I'm going to I'm, we're going to talk about assurance levels later in the presentation, but there's uh, four assurance levels, so from low to very strong, and you can take a look at all those things for just ID proofing. So do I just have uh, a very simple form of identifying you, just a photo ID, or do I actually have something that's a government-issued ID or two forms plus some sort of utility bill, etc.? So if you look at those levels and then you take the credential type that you're trying to issue and you combine it with things about the behavior on the web in terms of what you've been doing, whether you've been coming from a rogue IP address, what your location history is, if there's any IP velocity. So if you're trying to do a transaction uh, in Nigeria while you are clearly a Dutch resident, there are issues that, there obviously that you can create an IP risk score from. Um, and then finally, you have additional uh, authentication factors. And the whole clue about this is this is just one example. This is one way to do it, but it really depends on your ability to access this kind of information. So not everyone has access to knowing, for example, which mobile uh, switch you're sitting on or knowing what your um, IP velocity is, what your IP history has been over a significant amount of time. So that closes the gap in terms of what providers you can actually go to that can provide these kind of services. Not everyone can do it. That's the point I'm trying to make here. And if you look finally, like what we're really talking about is creating an ecosystem or a meta-identity system. And I'm using the word meta-identity because it's the words of um, Kim Cameron from Microsoft, who had set up uh, Cardspace as an initiative, and it was based on Higgins. And when he decided to uh, not do that anymore, the, these things are still sticky. So he has the seven laws of identity. If you want to Google it or nighttime reading, go for it. So he, really fundamentally what it 
what it is, is that we're talking about finding ways to make it much more attractive to be able to do identity on a very large scale for enterprise, to make it interesting for you to have a single identity for online transactions, or like, you know, a couple where you can actually manage what's happening with those things, that you don't leave trails everywhere. And the same look and feel, so it's a standard look and feel across all of the applications and services you want to do. You, as a user, have some freedom in terms of you only get to work with the brands you like and you only get to share the information you want rather than having it be aggregated and collected and without your knowledge or without your consent. And when we now combine all of those cool things that we want to be able to do, so if we say, okay, we know what we want to do with identity, we know that these systems are available and we know that uh, there's this possibility to set up uh, a meta system with uh, identity providers, attribute providers, users, and the whole exchange for government and enterprise and consumers, there's this concern of balancing it with privacy and security. So when we look at the basic tenets around privacy, we have fundamental issues. So we want to make sure that you know, a lot of the things that you do are going to be untraceable. So when you are using a claim, you don't want it to always be all the information to be sent all along the path and to be able to direct it back to you. You want it to not be able to be linked back to you from the relying party to the claims provider. You don't want the links to be discrete. You just want to say, is this person uh, of this particular claim, yes or no, and not have the actual information that's regarding that claim also be transferred between the relying party and the actual claims provider. Um, and it's the final thing also between relying parties. So let's say you have several relying parties that are working together. You don't want them to be able to have linkability between all of those different relying parties. So you don't want them to be able to share that transaction information between each other if they're in one identity ecosystem. Yeah, do you want only Google and Apple knowing what you're doing and being able to share all of that stuff between the two of each other? I, I think that would be... A nightmare. And the same issues around uh, non-disclosure. So it, it's really about just how much information you get to pass. So it's just sharing part of the claim rather than the full birth date. And finally, like when you look at it, actually, all of this stuff, all of these privacy tenets are being incorporated today into legislation. The question is just how far that's going to be impacting you on a day-to-day -day basis. So there's the White House Bill of Privacy Right that came out. February this year, and in January in Europe, there's the EU data protection regulation framework. So all of these things are privacy in, or privacy specific legislation that are coming down the pipe, but the question is just now about implementation and safeguarding these risks. Okay. The worst case scenario. None. This is you. This is Jerry Shaw. Sir, I have a series of purchases, preferences, and quantifiable data points that we define as your personality. We monitor every social network, internet log, instant and text messages, known associates, your friends, companions, emails received and sent, cell phone usage. We utilize security, surveillance, and traffic cameras to analyze movements. We use this data to form personality profiles. Yeah, I'm calling actually about you stop freaking out. We know who you are. We are everywhere. Why do you keep... Okay, if you guys Google Eagle Eye and look at, like, uh, uh, reviews about the movie, I think the best review I read was that it was a movie written by stoned third graders. Um, and that is probably true, because stoned third graders would come up with a, with a super, super bad guy who could look at everything and who had access to all that stuff. So how many of you guys think this is complete and utter crap? The, the eagle eye. Yeah? Okay. Totally impossible, right, to have all that information. Oh, you don't think it's crap? Of the same things? At all the things, yeah. Uh, 
Uh, okay, yeah. To see all of the information at one point, exactly. So, and what I'm trying to test is, it is difficult. Um, so, normally I do talks on lawful interception, and lawful interception is just that. Um, it's just about intercepting something that you have a warrant for on the basis of an actual crime, and then you have access to all of that person's communication details. But what I'm suggesting now is that actually with the way that we're doing big data and data aggregation, this is not so far-fetched. So um, if you take a look at this website, there is a company um, called Rapleaf, which actually sells personalization data. Um, and it's your attributes, and it's being sold as a commodity. So it's everything that we just talked about. We talked about attributes, uh, we talked about traits, and we talked about behavior online. And if you look at what kind of things that they're selling, um, if you take all of your email addresses, it, it, I don't know if you guys are surfing now, just surf to rapleaf.com. Just take a look at what they do. They have really huge coverage in the United States. They have a huge user base. What you do is you give them a list of email addresses or whatever, and they can go and try to find all of this different information about the email addresses that you give them. And it's really a, around targeted or directed marketing. So if you take a look, the initial thing, age, gender, location, that's free, yeah? So for a set of email addresses, let's say you give them a couple of hundred thousand, they can give you the age, the gender, and the location. Then, uh, for a premium service of one penny, you can get the house school income, the marital status, the children, the homeowner status, property type, length of the residence, uh, cars that you have in your household, there's financial details that they get, and this is just a, 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 a screenshot. So there's a lot more of this information. It's very inexpensive for these companies to provide because they provide it en masse, aggregate data that they've been collecting. They collect it from social networks, they collect it from mail feeds. Uh, we know that Google and Facebook do different kinds of collection, but my point is simply that it's not that impossible. That wasn't me. Um, it's not that impossible to get this data. So it, it actually, it, if, of course, you can't get the surveillance tapes and the street cameras, et cetera, um, unless you're some sort of government entity, but in general, the rest of the information about your online behavior, you can get access to. So, why do we do this? Why collect these identities and these rich attributes? I mean, it's just, what's the deal with the marketing? So it's really, it, it really is a money story. So the personal data that's there, that's floating all over the place about you, is really of value. So this is what gets advertisers to sponsor and pay for sites so that actual content and services of those sites can be um, legitimated and, and paid for and provided to you either free of charge or for a very small amount of money. And it's also the basis for like, how companies are evaluated. So if you look for, at Facebook, for example, the current stock market valuation, investors take every single profile on Facebook and they value it between 90 to 120 US dollars. Um, if you take a look at what happened to MySpace, the valuation dropped in 2007 because a whole bunch of users suddenly shifted. So what it means is that there's this continuous market drive to have more and more and more identities on these social networking sites because otherwise you don't do that magical thing, increase shareholder value. If you don't increase shareholder value, you're out of business. So the privacy legislation that's out there, it's really looking at protecting you but you in relation to uh, your government and to very specific organizations. It's not really doing this for things where you, you know, click, oh, I agree to a terms and conditions uh, thing, or when you say, yeah, I use my email address for your uh, upstream, uh, uh, whatever, marketing uh, channels. Th that's all still allowed. So if you're gonna do that, you know, all bets are off. But what if the flip side were equivalently true? Just like you can give your information away, what if you could actually get it paid for? So, yeah, you give your information to somebody, but they reimburse you for it. So if they want to know stuff about you, they just pay you. And so your anonymity is not a privilege, it's a right. It's a fundamental right, and so is your privacy. And when you decide to let go of parts of that right, then you get compensated. 
So this is a question, this is not a, a proposal. So would you be willing to actually sell attributes about yourself? And it's not a question that I'm asking to you alone, but it's questions that are being asked by different communities to try to find ways to make that balance between for the people who say, oh, you know what, I don't care if they know all that stuff about me, and those people who really do care. Yeah? So when you look at government identity initiatives, we talked about DG Day a moment ago, but there's a whole bunch of them, and they're happening all over the, uh, the place. So in Europe, in the United States, um, there, in the United States, there's NISTIC and FICAM, so it's the National Strategy for Trusted Identities, and FICAM is looking for holistic systems to be able to do identity management. Um, and there's also card-based schemes. So in Belgium, you have an EID card, just like you do in Germany, that you can also use for all of your government transactions. And it's not just for like e-voting, but for everything else you'd want to do to register the birth of a child or your marriage or whatever, or taxes. So all of these different schemes are being deployed. And the issue that you want to think about is, how secure is that? based on what I was telling you in the beginning of the talk about take a look about what happened in the Netherlands. How secure is that data that you think, you know, should be really well taken care of? Is it? And what schemes are they using? How open is it? How, what standards are they complying to? And if you take a look about how you actually want to start examining that, you can do that by looking at what is the approach of that particular government? So is it a compulsory national ID or is it not compulsory? Uh, are they doing it with a, a physical card or is it like a credential that you're getting? Is, there, is it one time? And when you look, you actually have results. So Germany, Belgium, Spain and Austria are doing it with a card. When there's no compulsory national ID system, do they have their own identity provider or have, have they outsourced that? to someone else. So when you look that way, then you have Holland falling in the bucket of, yeah, we've got it, that's DG Day and DG Notar. So Canada, New Zealand, Finland, and Estonia are compatriots in this scheme. And then when there's no compulsory identity provider and they're not likely to have one that's national, then you're looking at the USA, which is really expecting enterprises to come up with the standards and the solutions and the drive and the direction of all of these initiatives. And, and when you look at those initiatives, there's basically also a couple of camps. So you've got two different um, standard schemes. So in the United States you have NIST and in Europe you have STORC. They're pretty much the same thing. So the idea is you want a system, if you're going to put you know, your eggs in a couple of baskets or one basket, you want a system that has the full range. So when you don't need that much assurance for your identity, you want it, you're fine with a level one. And then when you do want to use that same credential for banking applications or to buy stuff or to get married to someone, then you really do want to have a NIST or historic level four. So you want to have a very high degree of assurance on that identity. Um, and, you know, fundamentally, it's fine when they tell you that, but there also needs to, you need to have a, a, some also quality assurance knowing that there's some independent verification of that identity scheme. So if you're living in Estonia or, sorry, the guy in, on this side in the front, you have a UK flag, are you from the UK? Oh, all right, Belgium, so you, now let's pretend you're from the UK, so. Um, <laughs> So if you were from the UK, then uh, what I would say is take a look at the scheme that the UK government has been introducing. They've put a lot of money in the UK uh, doing an identity scheme, which they then, um, as a result of the last administration, decided to chuck again, and now they're starting over from scratch. But when there's such a system in place, there's an ability to look at the actual way that it's being implemented. And it would be best if it was a third party looking at that implementation scheme rather than solely uh, one-sided assurance that it's safe. Um, and what I, I don't understand, and I, I don't think it's being utilized enough, there, there is some utilization. If you look, there's so much information about it. And there are systems that are complex, but scalable, and thereby making it a lot easier to use a, against a very large heterogeneous population and a large user base, and that's happening in uh, the education sector. And what we should be doing is looking far more to the education sector to provide a test bed, proven ground, you know, field testing of these kinds of schemes. So if you take a look on refeds, terina.org, what you're going to see is like per country, it's going to list what the identity scheme is for that entire country. And then 
you'll see like how that's been rated, how that's been broken down, and how that's been surveyed and assessed. So there are hundreds of different IDPs there. There are, are you know, tens of thousands of users per IDP scheme, so because of all the students that are out there. And they're all able to have federation, access each other's resources and libraries. It's a really cool system, and it should really be held and used far more as an example implementation for enterprises and for public cloud identity initiatives. And that's really where you can judge the success of you know, which scheme does work, where are the things I need to adjust for a consumer segment, and that's really where we should be looking at. So when we take a look in terms of what do we need to do now in the next couple of years for the identity ecosystem, first things first, interoperability. It's got to you know, work with open standards. It, initially, you can start with uh, one, just pick one, um, and then later you can incorporate the, the multitude, but really it's about interoperability. Then we know that no single uh, experience is, so, is going to work for all of the different use cases. So flexibility has got to be the deal. So whether you're, because you want to be able to use it for government, you want to be able to use it for Puma and Apple and you know, in the UK. I'm totally killing the guys in front, I apologize. So, um, and finally, you want to have some sort of mechanism that does provide uh, support for anonymity, so zero knowledge proof. Cryptography and other privacy enhancing technologies are going to be really the distinction between success and failure. Another weird thing, because of those attributes, people call them different names. So a taxonomy and a common syntax across the different IDPs for the age verification, for the other traits, for the behavioral usage, that's got to be there across all of the different parts in order for it to actually work. Um, and then we already mentioned compliance and accountability. You want to know that there's some sort of independent verification of these schemes. Imagine that you use one password and username and one strong auth for all of your stuff online. You don't need to do anything else. That, I think that would be really cool. I, it would probably be far more likely that you have two or three, but then at least you can manage it. So it will be varied and diverse, um, but it means that you can have the full gamut and range of services. So you can play your MMORPG games, and you can shop at Burberry, and you can do online banking and check the results of your medical exam. And that should be with one ID. And that's what I'm advocating. So. Um, It is for authentication. So it's not just proofing. Okay, but it's not authorization. It is authentication. It's authentication and authorization. Ah, but it's not all the information. No, no. It's there's no. That's exactly it. But that's my point. So your information isn't in one place. That's my whole point. So it's about that, those tenets that we talked about of privacy. No, you just have to say that it is that way. So between the IDP and the attribute provider and the relying party, it's a claims-based auth. It's just a yes or no question. The data doesn't move. I don't know anything actually about you. The data hasn't moved or sat somewhere else. It is, but it's... No, it doesn't require, yeah. Right? Is there a microphone? Yeah, is there a... Okay, you repeat the question. Sorry, so what, uh, I, th I thought we could hear him. Um, but what did... So, basic... <laughs> Hello. So basically, my it was not just a question. It was um, so basically what she's saying is that we are extremely exposed. Like all our data is out there, uh, and somebody could be like you know gathering that information, or those guys are could be like selling that information to a third party, right? So in order to authenticate yourself, you have to uh, instead of putting all your data, your personal data, uh, your medical records, whatever, in that place to validate you as a person. You're putting that and you're relying on one entity which has that identity validation. So basically you're moving all that, that 
like who you are mm. somewhere which could actually also can track every activity which requires a validation of yourself chronologically. So you, might, you can have in that central point all your activity records in one place plus it, who yeah. you are. Well, so that's exactly what I, I'm I think that's not very... No, um, but maybe it's because it's a misunderstanding. So, like, let's say you have people who you trust in real life, right? Brands who you trust, a government maybe that you trust. I don't know if you have that, but... So, if you have one of those, that would be the relying party. So, that's the person you want to try to get services from. So, if you look on that slide, there's data that you're trying to access or a service that you're trying to access or something you want to buy from the relying party. In order for the relying party to be able to give you the data or the service or the merchandise or whatever, they need to verify that you are you. The way that they do that is that you go in this slide, someone has, and there are, could be the same, but they are different as well. So they could be like eight different people, but it's about you choosing who you trust and where you decide to put that information. So for the identity proofing, you choose an identity proofer who just says, yeah, I know you're you to NIST level four. Yeah, because I've vetted you, I've come to your house, I've seen you physically, I know all of these different like passport information, blah, blah, blah. I've collected it and I've kept it safely. I myself, the ID proofer, should also be vetted to a certain level. So once that vetting has happened, that's a secure party, yeah? That's not gonna sell your data or throw it out on the internet or do something else with it. Then you have an identity provider, and this could be whomever you choose to make your identity provider. Chances are likely that it will not be a single identity provider who's providing multitude of services for you across the scheme of government or enterprise, like, I'm not sure where you work, but if there's an identity scheme there that requires federation and another one for your government ID and another one or another eight for your online shopping and gaming and social networking and blah, blah, blah. But the point is you choose and now you've limited the scope of your current thing because you have no idea where your data is now or all the websites and the cookies and everything else you visited. So the idea is this is a much more secure mechanism in order to do that without having the data actually move. All of these guys, the only thing they're asking is a single claim. Is this true? Yes or no? Are you over 18? Do you have this amount in your bank account? Are you allowed to access this data or this service? Are you allowed to conduct this transaction? Yes or no? That's it. But the full data about you, about your age, your actual balance. I, I, your I, I fully understand that. So I will give you a, uh, one, one sample. Um, somebody hack into the identity uh, proofing, right? Because that identity, identity proofing proofer. is going to have a log of at which time it proved who, when is uh, basically validating and saying like that. Yeah, that person is who he said or she said is. The other guy has another record of the request to this other entity. Somebody who hacks into only two places have an entire record of everything they that that keep, person did. Yeah, but that, if you have diversity, that person mm -hmm. hacks into one place and have only one record of what that person there is, was doing but there in There is place. inherently diversity. There's not just one place that does all this because the service, realistically, that's not yet possible. Hypothetically, if it were taking all the safeguards, you know, I still think it could be secure, but you need like a far better assurance level knowing that, for example, the data would be destroyed. And the data that's actually there for the transaction is just the, all of those things that we required for privacy, that there is no trail, that you don't have uh, residual data residing there, that you just have that claim. All how of those do, things, non-disclosure. But how, you, how do you enforce such a system like that? Yeah, but like that's you, the, you have yeah, to trust hey, somebody. And if I had that answer, you know I would have built it and sold it back. Like, but that's the whole point. So my point is that there are standards out there that are telling you how to do it, and that system still needs to be built. And it's, but it, you can validate it against those criteria. So what I'm giving you now is just, you've got to look at this, because at the moment, there's not a lot of people doing a lot of work um, that are really examining critically this stuff, other than a couple of uh, niche players in the identity segment. And there's a lot of stuff that's moving in legislation, it's all coming, but it's, you know, it's still got to get that critical mass of those requirements that I told you in order for it to be really interesting.
So I'm almost done. I've just got like two more slides. <laughs> so let me go back. Is there a party that I'm missing or something? All right. So we talked about that. You know, you have to audit it for compliance and accountability to make sure none of that stuff happens, that the data isn't being held when it's not being used. And the data that is actually being held doesn't contain anything that is higher disclosure than what's really required. So either non-disclosure or minimum disclosure of the actual information. The, finally, my point here, it's not going to be one person. The ecosystem is going to be varied. It is going to be diverse. And users will have more than one IDP. So they still will have to manage those divergent suppliers. But if you can port those identities across to places, that's going to be crucial. And that's going to determine whether, who you're going to use and whether they're going to be used and whether they're going to have some sort of critical mass. But there is going to be more than one. And finally, the whole system, this whole thing, is going to survive solely on the basis of user centricity. If you can't determine who you want to play with and what you want to tell them, you're not going to play. You might play in the short term because of the fact that you, you know, want to have the societal pressure that Bruce Schneier always talks about, that you, you, know, you want to make use of a service, so you sign away your consent in order to make use of a particular functionality of a service. You probably will do that. However, in the maturity term, you wouldn't do it. OK, good. But in, in terms of maturity, as this evolves, when I say you, I mean the general en masse. But as this evolves, you'll be able to make more choices as there is more diversity and heterogeneity in terms of providers. And then you can choose for someone who truly does that, who really just uh, allows you to read the fine print, make the right decisions, and really allows you to control your own data across these different trust frameworks. Mm-hmm. Yep. The relying party? So live. Yeah. Everybody's activity. You know what I mean, right? So so to rephrase yeah, so I don't know if you want to use your microphone and say that again or you want me to rephrase what you're saying. Let me just rephrase what he said for the people who may not have heard it. What he's saying is that now when you want to hack someone, you have to hack in all these different places. And later, it'll just be a couple of places that you need to do it in order to get all that information. But again, maybe I haven't expressed myself clearly, but that's the whole point of these systems. It's the whole way that the zero knowledge proof works. You can just send the claim and not the actual data. It doesn't have to stay anywhere. You just need it for that instance and you chuck that. You, you just need it for that transaction. So, That's gonna be somewhere. Like, so your, your proof has to be somewhere. Somewhere has to be the proof. Yes, there's some, yes. It, so, so you only need that point, you, you only need ID, that point by the provider. You hack into but that. But there is that diversity. Instead of having to hack thousand different places, you need uh -huh. only two. No, it's not two. It's going to be more because you have, will still have this multiple functionality that will be split up because it won't be the same. You know, let's take that offline. Are there, so this was the last quote that I wanted to read you, leave you with. I'm not going to read it out loud, but fundamentally what it's about is equipping users in order to make those choices. So equipping pretty much everyone in order to understand the risk that they have potentially to their privacy, but also to understand it's a really cool possibility in order to reduce this problem of too many passwords that, that's causing the insecurity in the first place. So if there's really viable mechanisms that are secure, that allow you to do uh, just that, have you know, a couple of usernames and passwords and reduce the complexity, that would be great. And especially if it's strong off around it. I mean, uh, yeah, so I would like that. And, um, I'm hoping that in the future you guys are going to like it too. And are there any other questions? Yeah, when when I see all this environment, the first thing I, I see is okay, this is good for the companies who is going where, who are going to make money out of my data, and it's bad for me because I'm not going to have any kind of privacy. So now, sorry, could you, um, yeah. for what? me when I all all this scenario. Yeah. It's really clear to me that this is very good for companies to make money out of me 
and very bad for me. And somehow, maybe I think similar to him, um, nowadays, when I get one password compromise, if I, for example, I decide to use Google to, to log in into everything, yeah. uh, when someone owns my phone, because I have an Android and then it's owned, and they steal my, uh, they ha I have a rootkit and they steal my password of Google, they can access everything they want. And not only that, if let's say I use Acme company instead yeah. of Google, I have to trust them. And they say they are not going to access my data, but they can. Wait, but they why can, do you have to? Why do you have to trust them? I have to, uh, it doesn't matter who, Google, my government, Acme, it doesn't matter. Whenever I have to log in somewhere, that company, without me, they also can do it. They can go to the other company and say, hey, this guy just asked for his data, and on the other side, themselves are saying, yes, and I agree, it's this guy. So please me, show me now the data. They can do that. They, won't, they say they won't do that because they want to sell trust, but, but they can do that. They can. Yeah, but so except, what's the sense of privacy? Except, except what you're talking about, the scenario of identity theft, that somebody else takes your password and does that, that password, the username password, for the thing that you have specified that to use is probably very limited. So the idea is that these systems, what, what I'm talking about, the identity ecosystem, the fundamental basis is that there's already strong auth built in. So it's not just your username and password. So you're not going to be able to get access to it without an SMS OTP or a token, or something else, or some sort of knowledge-based uh, authentication that knows something about where you are, or how you are, or your phone is in a particular area, et cetera. So it's the combinations of that yeah. that allow you to actually have some degree of certainty that when you are trying to authenticate to these services, you are doing it in just, but of course, and not just with the yeah, but, and but of course, when I decide to rely on Google to do whatever, or rely on Microsoft, Right. At the very first moment I decide to rely on somebody, that yeah. somebody has everything they need to do it without me. Because they also can uh, ask directly and, and, and they have every, every, any data they need to do it. So the company I'm going to rely most, right. they will be able to impersonate me if they want. But they the say they is, won't do it, but they will be still, able. It's still the combination of all of that stuff that you have, and if you trust that company, then you should be able to trust them later anyway. And you still, is, it's, okay, I, I think if you have strong auth and you have something you have and something you know, and, sorry? Like, if you have one, like, one point, which is yeah. saying who you are, and like, um, validating who you are, that's why I asked at the beginning if it was also for uh, authentication, not just validating, uh, you know. It is who, for authentication, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so that it's, uh, if it's uh, for authentication, it's uh, like, for example, you have, I don't know, in, in this system with Twitter or anything else, that you have a token, and if you have that token, then you are authenticated already, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so that means whoever that has, has that can access my data. If you have only one, place which can access, that can do the authentication for you, then that person can impersonate you in every single service and access everything they... But they still have to send the credential somehow to you. So if they're sending it to your mobile phone or you're getting a token issued like on your RSA token or whatever, you still have to have that token. So I still don't know exactly what you're... You mean that the endpoint is the one who has to send me the, the message or the provider? The no, the IDP provider? will trigger the sending of the, of the token or the SMS OTP or whatever so they're who, using. So then what prevents depending that, on the transaction that, you're that, trying to do. That, that entity to impersonate me anytime. But anytime. how would they how would they do that? They would how would they impersonate you without actually like they can only trigger the sending. They don't actually have the token to to like replay the token or something. They're only they triggered. The it's just strong authentication. It's just how strong okay. authentication works I, I, today. I, I, I create, I'm, I'm, I'm the entity, right? You ask me, hey, authenticate me against him. So then I tell, yeah, yeah, is is uh, is she? And I send you, uh, uh, that's that's the case, right? I send you a token. Yeah, uh, but the, the actual token still gets verified. It's the actual strong auth. It's just 
when you say what part about it you, is you, it's a claim for a particular attribute. So the claim is not just, yeah, it's him. The claim is, okay, I've validated now the token, and now I know that this person is logged in successfully. That says it's you. After that, the claim is, how old is he? Can he pay for the iTunes movie the he just downloaded? Is, the that's data, the claim. The data, that, that data is, 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 uh, is, but that's is, what we're talking about. So that's where there are different players in that diagram doing different things. You need to have collusion or a single entity that's doing all of it in order for what you're suggesting to work. So there is diversity. That, that's why I'm saying perhaps that wasn't clear enough when you had the different boxes on the screen. But the point of having a relying party on one end with an IDP and an attribute provider and a different ID proofer is, yeah, of course, there are potential scenarios where it could be the same company providing those different services and functionalities. But it's highly unlikely that that is the case. Because usually you go to Puma to buy your stuff. I think that means my time's up. <laughs> I'd like to thank you very much, Jaya. Thanks.